Chapter 6 Another Strange Note When Pam expressed her fear that Ricky might have fallen off the building, everybody became worried. The crowd was silent as the Hollisters began a search. Pete hurried down an alley on one side of the building, while Pam raced along the other. Mr. Hollister and Holly ran through the trading post to the rear. Still, Ricky could not be found. When the searchers returned to the street, Will Wilson, who was in the crowd, called to Pete, Say, I bet I know where your brother went. You do? Where? Pete asked eagerly. I think I saw him running home crying, Will said. What would you do that for? Pete asked, not certain whether to believe Will or not. No reason. He's just a big crybaby, Will said. He is not, Holly defended her brother, as Pete turned away in disgust. Suddenly, Pam cried out, Listen, everybody. The sound of a deep chuckle could be heard. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, everybody. The voice seemed to come from the rooftop, and everyone looked up. The bag on Santa Claus's back wiggled a little, and suddenly a boy's head popped out of it. Ricky! Holly shrieked. He's been hiding in Santa's bag! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Ricky called out again. Same to you! cried several in the crowd. Mr. Hollister, much relieved, shook his head over the boy's prank. Come down here, he ordered. We've all been worried about you. Ricky climbed down the ladder, and Indy put it away. Dusk was beginning to fall, and Pete said, Dad, it's time to turn on the lights, isn't it? Mr. Hollister, looking up at the darkening sky, agreed. Okay, click the switch, son, he replied. Indy had put the plug into an extension cord, which led to the inside of the trading post. When Pete flipped the switch, a floodlight showed up the scene. The lead reindeer's nose lighted up, the animals turned their heads from side to side, and the air was filled with the strains of jingle bells. The onlookers clapped, and some began to hum the familiar Christmas tune. Those Hollisters certainly have happy ideas, said a gray-haired woman. Oh, they're not so great. The boy grumbled under his, under his breath. He was Joey Brill. He bent over and made a hard snowball. Taking careful aim from behind a telephone pole, he let it whiz toward the roof of the trading post. Smack! The snowball hit the lead reindeer on the nose. Crash went the red bulb, scattering into a thousand pieces. Who did it? Pete shouted angrily. That boy who's running away, the woman volunteered. What a mean thing to do. Pete caught sight of Joey and dashed after him. But Joey turned the corner and disappeared. I'll settle that score later, Pete declared. As he returned to the store, Holly hurried up to him. Indy put a new bulb in. See, the reindeer's nose is working all right again. Pete glanced up to see the new light in the reindeer's swaying head. Joey'd better not break this one, he said. At this moment, Dave Mead, who had just arrived, hurried over to the Hollister children. The outfit up there sure is swell, he said. There's never been anything like it in Shoreham. Ricky told him about Joey, and Dave said he's just trying to get even, I'll bet. What do you mean? Pete asked quickly. Oh, haven't you heard? Heard what? Guess who's delivering orders for Mr. Tash? Not Joey Brill. Yes. So that's why he threw the snowball at our Santa Claus outfit, Pete said. He told Dave about how the hardware store owner, Mr. Tash, had tried to buy the sleigh and reindeer that had been promised to the Hollisters. Joey's probably sore because your store got it, Dave said. He laughed. You'd better keep an eye on him. He may try to knock Santa's head off next. You're right, Pete said. 
I'm going over to Mr. Tash's right now and speak to Joey if he's there. Accompanied by Dave, Pete walked to the next street and into Mr. Tash's store. It was far from neat, and a variety of items were scattered in untidy piles all over the floor. Joey was at a counter, wrapping an order, as Pete approached him. He scowled when he saw the two boys. What are you doing here? Joey asked sullenly. I'm here to warn you about our Santa Claus outfit, Pete said. Don't throw any more snowballs at it. I'll throw snowballs any time I feel like it, Joey snapped back. I'm warning you for the last time, Pete said, and left the store. Arriving back at the trading post, he found his father, sisters, and brother ready to leave for home. Dave went with them as far as his house, then said goodbye. At home, Sue was excited to hear about the reindeer and wanted to see them. So Mr. Hollister drove her downtown to see the display. Oh, Daddy, she cried in delight. Your store is the mostest, bestest one in town. And I hope, he said, chuckling, that it will bring the mostest, bestest gifts to the unfortunate children who may not receive any special presents. I hope the sleigh has so many things piled in it, they'll reach to the sky, Sue said, clapping her hands. By the time she and her daddy reached home, supper was ready. Crickets, it's getting cold, Pete said, as an icy blast of wind rumpled his hair. They went into the garage and patted the burrow. Suddenly, Ricky shouted, look at this, Pete, another note on Domingo. Around the burrow's neck was a ribbon, similar to the one they had found before. On it was a message, which read, I'm the best little burrow in creation. Please use me for a Christmas blank. Y-I-F. Yikes, said Ricky. What rhymes with creation? This one's easy, said Pete, grinning. I'll bet it's decoration. You mean we should hang Domingo on the Christmas tree? Pete laughed. Try and do it, but maybe he could be a decoration in some other way. Ricky sighed. If Domingo could only talk, he could tell us who this mysterious YIF is. Then Ricky sobered. Pete, doesn't Dad say yours sincerely on business letters? Yes. Why? I'll bet YIF stands for yours internally forever. Pete roared. You mean eternally, not internally, Ricky. But even if you are right, it doesn't tell us the writer's name. I guess you're right, said Ricky. Anyway, Mr. Vega couldn't have written this note. But who was it? Pete put the note into his pocket to show to the other Hollisters later. Then he got a bucket of grain for the pet while his brother brought a pail of fresh water. Domingo tried to follow them outside. He missed his exercise today because we didn't come right home from school, Pete said. Come on, old boy, I'll give you a run. He climbed on to Domingo's back without bothering to put on the saddle, and away they went. Soon Pete regretted that he was riding bareback. Hey, Domingo, take it easy. But the little donkey was having too good a time to stop and raced down the street as fast as he could go, with Pete clinging to his stubby mane. Whoa! Whoa! the boy cried. Finally, Domingo turned back. How glad his rider was to get off! Pete limped into the house and put a pillow on a chair before sitting down to study his homework. He showed the note he had just found on the donkey to his family. Mr. Hollister stroked his chin. This really is a mystery, he said. It's Domingo's secret, all right. But we'll solve it, Pam declared, as she got her school books. When she finished studying, she said to her father, Dad, have you put an ad in the newspaper yet telling people they can buy gifts for the sleigh at a special price? No, Pam, I haven't. How would you like to write one for me tonight? Okay, Dad, Pam replied. First, I'm going to listen to Pete's spelling words. 
Pete and Pam often helped each other with their homework, Pam listening to her brother's spelling, and Pete checking his sister's arithmetic problems. When this was done, Pam sat down to write an advertisement. She asked Pete to listen to it. Be a Santa Claus, like the one on the roof of the trading post. Help fill our sleigh with gifts for people less fortunate than you. The trading post will grant a special low price on presents for the sleigh. All items will be gift wrapped and delivered by us on Christmas Eve. When Pam finished, Pete ex exclaimed, that's swell, Pam, let's show dad. They hurried into the living room where Mr. Hollister was reading the evening paper and showed it to him. This is fine, he said, good job, Pam. Suppose you leave it at the office of the Shoreham Eagle tomorrow morning. Pete and Pam left the house early for school in order to make the stop. As Pete had guessed the evening before, it had grown very cold, and at times the two children had to walk backward against the wind. The result was that Pete smashed squarely into a tree. Oh, the poor maple, Pam teased, and Pete grinned. They went on, and soon reached the Eagle office. Look who's here, Pam said. In front of them at the classified ad counter stood Joey Brill. He had a piece of paper in his hand and was saying to a young woman, Mr. Tash wants you to put this ad for a Santa Claus outfit in tomorrow's paper. Then he turned around. His eyes widened when he saw the Hollister children. Oh, trailing me, eh? Joey said unpleasantly, always trying to play detective. Then he sneered, you're not going to get away with what you're doing. Get away with what? said Pete. Well, Mr. Tash is going to get a Santa Claus and a sleigh and reindeer too, and they're going to be twice as big as yours. With that, Joey pushed open the street door and hurried out. I'll bet he doesn't find another one, Pete said as he handed the advertisement to the clerk. But Pam continued to worry about the affair, although her brother forgot about it during school hours. As the Hollister children met after school that afternoon, Pete said, let's go skating, the ice is swell. Ricky readily agreed, and the two boys hurried for their skates. Soon they were gliding over the glassy surface making figure eights and chasing around in circles. Pam and Holly stopped for a few minutes at the hunter's house. When they finally reached their own home, they were just in time to meet Sue, who came running from the garage. Pam, Holly, she shouted as she raced up to them. Something's terrible wrong with Domingo. What do you mean? Her sisters asked fearfully. Domingo, he's shaking all over, Sue cried out.